For those of you that have not seen the Avalanche video, you can watch it on YouTube. It's six minutes long. It's just an abbreviated version. Here we go. This is coming to you from a man who has just passed through the valley of the shadow of death. Since my close call with eternity, just a short while ago, everything has become, become clearer. I can hear his whisper. Unobeyed obedience has become my mandate. And that's why I'm speaking to you tonight. A short while ago, after enjoying a quality time with Jesus, I was surprised by an alarming vision. Now for those of you that are watching, let me have this camera. For those of you that are watching, you don't understand what a vision is. Well, neither do I. I'm a very simple man. I'm not a stuck-up prophet. And if you ever get around a stuck-up prophet, run for your life. <laughs> because prophets are supposed to be humble. They're supposed to be full of tears. They're so broken over their nation and shocked that they've received a word. They're undone in their spirit, man, that God would speak to them about the condition of their nation. So here it was early one morning, and I was having this encounter with God. I remember it was eight o'clock, and this was just a couple months ago. It was as if it was yesterday. And I closed my eyes. When I closed my eyes, it was like watching a program on television in full color. It was like watching a movie. And I saw a resort, a beautiful ski resort. For those of you that are watching perhaps in the darkest corners of Africa or some parts of Asia, somewhere maybe you've never ever seen high mountains and glaciers and snow. Surely you've seen pictures of a ski resort all we're talking about is an alpine-looking village, an Austrian-looking village. And that's what I saw in this vision. I saw this village. This village was full of color. Remember, we're talking 8 o'clock in the morning. I was just having a cup of coffee, spending time with the Lord, by the way, this book that I carry in my hand. I love this. This is a Gideon's Bible, and it was given to me by a couple in Scotland whose son had died of a brain tumor. He was a major sports figure in the country of Wales. And he had moved to the United States. To become more famous, he came to the United States as a drug addict and a pornographer and womanizer, just a wicked man, but very, 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 very professional in his sport of choice, which was wrestling. He died suddenly of a brain tumor, and his parents came to clean up his apartment. And while they were cleaning up his apartment, Pastor, they uh, looked at the video cabinet and it was full of these VHSs. They were all covered in brown paper, which meant one thing and one thing only. It was black market pornography. 
because that's how it came in the mail. And when they looked over at this black, this cabinet that was full of all these rows of what they certainly thought was pornography, they knew this dear, saintly British couple from Wales, and Wales is just part of Great Britain, for those of you that are unfamiliar with that beautiful part of the world, and you're so fortunate to be from there. Nathan, I love your country, and I love your people, and I thank Great Britain for what they did for us. If it wasn't for you, we would probably not have the gospel here. But this couple came to me. I was doing the 100 year anniversary of the Welsh revival. It was thousands, many more people than we have here tonight. And they said, Mr. Hill, we wanna give you something. We're the heads of the Gideons and they told me a quick story. And then he said, our son went to the United States as a professional, but he was a pornographer, he was a wicked man. And we prayed for him and we went back to get all his belongings after he died. And we knew we had to go through these cabinets of VHSs, so we began to go through them and we opened them up and we put them in the deck and we started to play them. And the first one we played was you. It was you. You were preaching a message called White Cane Religion. And then the next one we put in, it was you. And then the next one we put in was you. And I remember I used to tell people to buy a copy and go bootleg it. <laughs> I told them, I said, buy as many as you want and make as many copies because I don't care. And if you're here in the ministry or you're there in the ministry, you're watching and you're into money. You're into the devil's workshop. Quit looking at people with dollar signs or euros on their heads. Start looking at people as souls. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you say, what does this have to do with the vision? Everything, folks. It's all, everything's connected. It's all connected when it comes to Jesus and his blood. And they said every single one of the VHSs, it was you. And his roommate came in and said, and I'm giving you a fictitious name. They said, oh, Bob, Bobby. Oh, he came here a bad person. But he got a hold of whoever that is on those tapes. And he got so transformed. And he died on fire for Jesus. So here... And it's written, it's written in the front of the book. And so I carry this everywhere I go. I carry this and I carry sinners in the hands of an angry God. And I figure with these two books, this right here, the Bible, and sinners in the hands of an angry God, the greatest sermon ever preached outside of the Sermon on the Mount, I feel like I'm pretty safe. So, you know, devil, if you want to hit me on this side or this side, from the front, front, don't even try it because I've got a tongue. <laughs> and I can take you down with my tongue. But here was this vision. I had all these people in this resort, these vacationers, and I was watching them. Everyone was having a good time. Thousands of people. As I was watching this in my his vision 
Kids were ice skating. People were drinking hot chocolate. There were people inside stores shopping. Everything was fast, but everything was slow in the vision. I could see everything all at once, but everything was slow. I can't remember a time of enjoying anything as much as I enjoyed what I was watching. So I just kept my eyes closed. And then suddenly, people started to scatter with urgency. The laughter was over. They began to take, take off to their apartments, to their condos, to their hotels, as fast as they could. And then a storm started settling over the resort. And I sat there with my eyes closed watching this storm. And then a group of men and women gathered off to my right and everything started moving fast. And the men and women off to my right were screaming at one another. And they weren't mad, but they were urgent. They had passion. And oh, how I love passion. They had passion and they had different uniforms on and I realized that they were the ski patrol. See, I'm a skier. All my family, we're all skiers. We know what the resort looks like. Many of you know what I'm talking about. They're beautiful. And I know what the ski patrol looks like. And usually they're there just taking care of people during the day. If they break a leg or something happens in the resort, they fix them. They put them on the beds. They put them on the cots. They put them on the sleds. And they take them down the mountain to the hospital. That's what they do. That's what they're paid for. But this was different. In the vision, they were mounting helicopters. They were getting on snowmobiles. And a group of them were manning these massive anti-tank weapons. And they were aiming them up into the mountains. They were sticking these huge artillery shells. These were howitzers and they were aiming them five miles into the mountains. They began shooting these shells five miles. They disappeared in my vision but explosions could be heard everywhere. And the helicopters were dropping bombs and those that were in snowmobiles were drilling holes in the snow and then they would drive off in their snowmobiles and then it, they'd ignite the bombs that they had dropped into the holes that were blowing up. What I soon realized was a potential avalanche. See, that was not just a storm that came in. Everybody in the ski resort, they were looking forward to powder. If you're a skier, fresh powder is wonderful. But it wasn't fresh powder. This was a blizzard. And it was coming in with such force. It was mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. Two feet, three feet, four feet. And the ski patrol knew if they did not kill the avalanche, the avalanche would kill the people. And I began to cry because the Lord showed me and listen up everyone at home, listen up everybody, every teacher, every prophet, every Christian. This was not me sitting there reading a story. I'm watching this come down and if you don't believe in visions, signs and wonders, then you don't believe this book. And if you believe it was for yesterday, you don't believe this book. He's not finished. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. There shall be visions and dreams. Christians are so dumb. And I say that spiritually stupid. I hurt for Christians. You live in a world of fantasy. 
You live in a world of tradition. And there's something to be said about tradition, and I'll say that in just a few minutes. But God has got something to say to the present generation. And he's saying that right now through this minister. So the bombs were going off and the snow was coming down and everybody was asleep in their condos. Those are all in the dream, in the vision. Those were all Christians. Those were all the believers. The resort is the church. Everyone comes to church to do what? To enjoy themselves. And even nowadays, I mean, to drink lattes, to hot, have hot chocolate, to shop. They come to church to have a good time. Everyone pays to come to church. They pay their tithe. They give offerings. Everyone comes to resort to the resort to have a good time. You've come tonight in a few minutes. We're going to pray for people. Lay hands on people. Those of you that are watching from other lands, I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're going to be praying for folks. I lay hands on people that are 4,000 miles away. Touch. And people fall out under the power in Zimbabwe. How'd that happen? Let's see. Maybe... Maybe it was God. Hmm? His hand is not shortened. So, let me get a little bit heavier before we close. I'm crying my eyes out. I'm 20 minutes into it. I'm a very sensitive man. I've lived all over the world. I've moved 24 times. I've moved my family from mansions as far as nice homes, not luxurious mansions, but nice homes into the ghetto. Why? To start a church. I'm just, you know, not into stuff. I'm into him, just him. When, I, when it's all over, I want him to go, well done, Steve. You did not plant yourself. Now, I believe some people can plant themselves in one area for all their lives because God called them to. But could you imagine how many Christians are out there still doing this? What are you doing? I'm believing God. For what? He's going to speak to me. How old are you? Eighty-two. How long have you been asking? Well, when I was about 12, he said he was going to use me. I meet people like that, folks. I don't live in frustration anymore. I live in amazement. I just... Jerry, I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine. You know, God called us to Argentina. I couldn't imagine us, us still being in Tallahassee talking about Argentina. We planted one church there that's already planted 25 churches. It's the biggest missions church in Argentina. And we started in our garage. So, you know, I can't imagine just sitting back, not doing anything. Well, the ski patrol are the prophets, the apostles, one lady that was reading the book, she goes, wait a minute, Brother Steve, I understand. A prophet is supposed to be like a meteorologist. He's supposed to see the snow coming. I said, okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, you begin to understand. She goes, the snow. You're talking about all the false teaching. I said, yeah, now. The false teaching. Here's what the Lord told me. Here's a false teaching that is falling on the church. The avalanche that's building above the church while we 
<laughs> sleep. The overemphasis on grace. Some call it, hey, some call it greasy grace. I don't ever call it greasy grace. I don't, I can't put that word with grace. Grace is, oh, grace. Do you know who wrote that? John Newton wrote that. You want to know when he wrote it? He wrote it when his ship just about went down. John Newton was a slave trader. John Newton, when right before he, I mean, he was going to die, and God spared his life, and he wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. John didn't write, you've given me grace so I can sin. And I can live so free. I don't want to sit in front of John Newton at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those of you that are teaching this grace message that is damning millions of people. Oh, I think you're going to go to heaven. You're going to go to heaven because of the very thing you've been slopping around. You're going to get to heaven because of grace. The loving favor of your father is going to get you to heaven, but maybe you'll sit across from them, from John Newton. Maybe that'll be your dessert at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and John Newton will look at you and say, could we speak just for a few minutes about grace? So, I'm one of those, I believe we can stop all this nonsense. The snow that's coming down, the deification of man. Deification. Look at me, church. You're smart. You're not stupid. Look at me around the world. You're not dumb. Oh, come on. Look at the deification of man is lifting man up where God's supposed to be. Satan already tried that. Satan already tried that. It doesn't work. Lucifer got higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And he wrote songs. Oh, Lyndall, Lydia, you guys are phenomenal songwriters. But I want to tell you, nobody can hold a candle to Lucifer. When he walked, theologians, I don't know. They believed that he was like a pipe organ. That he was just like music. He had to have been incredible. He had a third of the angels following him. And he, he had to have been so good and so lifted up and so close to him that he goes, what am I doing in second place? That's the deification of man. Look at me, folks. We want to welcome our Lord and Savior and then they name the name of our president. Oh, if you haven't heard that, go on YouTube. Type in Lord and Savior and type in our, our president. And, oh, let's not pick on our president. Let's pick on the other party. Look at Top Magazine last week. Go online and find it out for yourself. Is this our, our new Republican Savior? Names that are so given to God. We're tossing around like toys. That's the deification of man. And as you begin to worship man and place him in that place of God, then you're setting the world up for the Antichrist. Everyone is going to be so accustomed to looking at man, then someone's going to come along and have the answers, and they haven't been listening to God for years. 
They've just been listening to man. Oh, wake up. You're asking God to speak to you on this night? Come on. Come on. Then how about this? How about, oh, and I'm, I got to close. I got too much here. No, but how about the, um, the, uh, the attempting, the attempted destruction of the validity of the Word of God? The Word of God is under attack. Now look at me. When you go up to somebody and say, I remember a day where I, what's your name? Jason? Jason, I remember a day I could walk up to somebody and say, the Bible says in John chapter 3, you know, and people would go, you know, they'd have this, like this fear. Now people look at you and go, so? So? Oh, if you haven't heard that, you're not out there talking to people. This book, David Ravenhill just returned from Australia. Maybe you've heard me say this on television, I don't know. But he just returned from Australia, and he said, they're teaching there that there are no more judgments. There's no judgment seat of Christ. There's no great white throne judgment. There is no, there's a point unto man, and after that, and to die, and after that, the judgment. Charlie, there's no more judgments. If there's no more judgments, and the Word of God has no validity, and then universal reconciliation means everyone is saved. In Germany, and if you think I'm throwing this stuff out at you, folks, there's an international audience listening to me. Every, everyone is saying, it's about time! And I'm not the only one standing up, and I'm no hero. I'm just not going to drop the torch. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. And so here we close. So I got on the phone. I'm closing. By the way, if you want to know how to combat all these layers of snow. Remember the bombs dropped from the helicopters? I'm going to simplify this. I've got tons of notes here, okay? You combat lies with truth. It's very simple. And if somebody comes up to you and says, and says, Allah, he is God. You look up at them and don't go like this. What is this? You look up at them and go, Jesus. He is the only God. And for those of you, where's my camera? For those of you, that are watching at home, and you're just sort of like wondering how this all fits, I wanna tell you, there's only one way it all fits. There's one God, his name is Jesus. Yeshua, Messiah. Those of you from the, my blessed Jewish nations that you, you, you love God, but you're confused. He has already come. His name is Jesus. So there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus. That's how you blow that up. Okay? And the people that come to you and say, well, you know, once you believe in Jesus, you have freedom to do anything you want. 
Look at me, folks. I don't know where to start. I got so many bombs in my arsenal for that one. It's like, let's see, do I want to kill them right off? Or do I want to take them down slowly? I mean, I don't know how many guns you have. We, we, this is America, okay? I went down to the store the other day, just sort of check out the guns. This was a huge gun store. They had none. They, I'm talking about, they usually have guns from here all the way over. I mean, they have like, you know, Uzis and stuff and just submachine guns. But everyone, you, you know, got to... You got to pop them, you know, but as fast as you can pull the trigger, a bullet's going to come out. They had nothing left. (laughs) Nothing left. So maybe, you know, nowadays, I don't know, we'll just take them out one BB at a time, you know? (laughs) But uh, when someone says that, you know, once you receive Christ, you know, you can do anything you want, I I go, let's see, I usually start with holiness. That without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That should keep somebody busy for quite some time. I need somebody's cell phone. This man right here, I've been picking on you. Jason, is it? Yeah, I want your phone. Jason, your phone, I like it. (laughs) Fortunately, I have a nice one too, okay? But your phone has been seen by millions of people, okay? That's pretty cool. I got my phone out after the vision. And I called a friend in Aspen. For those of you watching from outside of the United States, Aspen is a city in the United States in the mountains. And um, it's a ski resort, beautiful ski resort. My wife and I have enjoyed it. And I called her up and I asked her if she could get me in touch with the ski patrol. She said, uh, when? I said, right now. And she said, that's going to be very difficult. This is Saturday. And I said, I got to talk to them. She said, the best thing I can do is Monday. And I said, I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. Now, I was crying so hard. My phone was sticking to my face. You could hear it as I pulled it away from my face because of what I'd seen. I'd seen the layers of snow that had come down. I saw the ski patrol blowing up the mountains. I saw the Christians or the resort goers sleeping. It all occurred to me what's going on in the church world. It was clear And so now I was walking. I can take you to the place in my kitchen. The vision happened on a couch. And I got up and I walked into the kitchen. I can take you to the place where I leaned up because I have a hard time walking. And I was leaning up in the kitchen when the phone rang. And it was the ski patrol. They called back within an hour. And I said, my name is Steve Hill, can you help me? And I said, I've just had something happen to me. I'm gonna call it a vision, I don't know. Now remember, I've known the Lord for 37 years, folks. I don't play games, you know me. So many of you know me. And I told him what I had just seen and I knew that he could have thought that I was some type of idiot. But I didn't care because I knew what I had just seen. And I said, would you explain to me if it was true? And he said, Mr. Hill, everything that you just saw is the truth. He said, 
when a storm comes in, we man helicopters, we man snowmobiles, and I personally man howitzer anti-tank weapons, and I blow shells through the mountains up to five miles into the mountains to blow up the avalanches before they kill the people that are below. We have to send out patrols ahead of time to warn everybody below that the mountain's about to come down. And I was crying like a baby because I realized my responsibility and your responsibility. And then he did something that I'll never forget. He said, Mr. Hill, can I say something to you? And he lifted his voice and he began to scream at me. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. But he began to scream at me like a general would scream at a general in a war room. And he said this, and remember this just happened two months ago. Daniel, where are you at? I wish I could tell people what we know, but there's no time. Daniel's on staff with us along with Sean, sitting next to him. We know so much about this stuff, it would blow your mind. Now I know why God has revealed this to me. He goes, Mr. Hill, do you want to know why people die? And he said it just like that, die! I said, why? He said, they die because they don't listen to me. I warn them to stay off the back country. I warn them, I warn them to stay out of the avalanche terrain. But they get on their helicopters and they get on their snowmobiles and they go anyway. And he said, an hour later, I'm digging their corpse out of the snow. And this is what they do. The people did not obey, like many of you in this room are not going to obey in just a minute. Lyndall, I want you to come and play softly on the piano. They see their trails. We were just up in Utah. Where do you think the footage came from? You want to know where that footage came from? That footage came from the avalanche terrains. Dan, you remember we were just there? You remember they had barriers up? And you remember the snowmobile tracks that went around the barriers? Remember seeing those? I was crying in my spirit. How many people have I warned, Pastor, over the years, don't go into drug addiction. Stay away from pornography. Stay away from this grace teaching. Stay away from this universal reconciliation. Stay away from anyone who is dumbing down the Word of God. Stay away from anyone, any, any group of people that are worshiping man rather than worshiping God. But they do it anyway. And this is what the ski patrol, and I'm closing with this, this is what they have to do. 
they get on their ski mobiles, their snowmobiles, and they follow the tracks. And this is what Steve Hill has done for over 37 years. And they come up and they pull out this. This. I want everyone in the, the world, if we're still on, are we on for a few more minutes? I want you to see this, Austria, Germany. This is from your country. This is an avalanche probe. This is the saddest illustration I've ever used in my life. Just stay up here, Daniel, but let me have this. You know what they use this for? They use this to find bodies. And they're guessing. They're guessing. Because if the skiers did not have some type of electronic probe on them, then it's just guesswork. And so they pierce the snow. This is the most expensive probe you can buy. They pierce the snow. And it's hard. By the way, the bottom layer of snow doesn't take long. It turns to cement. For those of you that are construction workers, it turns to cement. Imagine if you're on the bottom layer of some of this teaching, like the grace teaching, you're at the bottom layer and someone has lied to you for so long and you're just stuck. You came to church just to have a good time, but the pastor stood up there. Go get that. How many times? Keep your mind off Daniel, keep it over here. Have I pierced? Pastor, how many times at Brownsville did we dig through the snow? How many altar calls did I give? How many times in one night did I give altar calls? over and over and over and over and over and uh, what's that it's a body it's a body Sean quick a body this is from Germany. This is not a toy. This is the most expensive shovel you can buy for digging corpses. It's called the beast. You don't want to have this in your backpack. This is not to take to the beach and make a sand castle. This is to dig someone out of the snow and you start digging and you're digging, and you're digging, and you warn these people. How many people have I warned over the years? Those of you listening from Norway, Sweden, Scotland. How many times have I preached in your nations? Holiness, England, listen to me. I've preached all over your nation. Not only alone, but with Reinhard Bonnke, with other friends, Germany, Japan. Thailand, Malaysia, New Zealand. And we hit the body, dig all around her.
we get around her face and there's no pocket. See, when there's no pocket of air around the face of the individual, that means they got covered so quickly with the false teaching that they couldn't dig an air pocket around them. They couldn't get around Steve Hill or John Kilpatrick or somebody quick enough to help them dig around and, and, and so that they could breathe. But they got so covered with this stuff that they died. Daniel, come over here with that. I want you to turn him up. This is a teaching from one of the largest churches in a huge city in the United States. Day before yesterday, this is the teaching of the pastor and this is why this girl is dead. This is two days ago. Just listen to it. This is only going to be like three or four lines. So please pay attention. This is an email that we got. If you're not having fun, it's not God. He set you free to have fun. If it's work, you're under the law. Grace is nothing but fun. You don't have to pray an hour a day. Your pastor doesn't, so why should you? It doesn't matter if you pray or fast. You can't make anything happen. It was already finished on the cross. You can't bind or loose anything. Nothing you do matters. All you have to do is let things happen and enjoy life. That was two days ago. Now I'm going to challenge everyone from now on. I don't want you to be surprised at anything. Matter of fact, I'm tired of the church being so surprised. We're the fools. We're the fools. We let this stuff just go on right under our noses. And so she's dead. And so we spend our lives hoping. People are weeping all over this building. You want to know why you're weeping? Because you've taken that avalanche probe and you tried to find your son or your daughter, your uncle, your mom, your dad. And they said something like this, oh, you don't have to be that religious. Huh? You don't have to be so on fire for God. So instead, young people, because young people don't want to settle for, they don't want to be mediocre. They want to be either in or out. And since you said you don't have to be on fire, they just go out. And they die in their sin. Everyone stand. Lydia, come join us up here. rest of the team. I am a, I'm not afraid of anybody. We get hate mail. Folks, nothing's funny anymore. Look at me. Don't laugh anymore. It's, nothing's funny. The world is spiraling into hell. It's not a joke anymore. Jack Hayford said a couple things to me. And Jack, you may be watching this. I'm sure somebody sent it to you. He said a couple things to me. I said, Jack, can I repeat you? And it was about this vision. How many are familiar with Jack Hayford? Raise your hand. 
He's pretty well respected. He said, Steve, everything I said, you can put it on a billboard and sign my name to it concerning the vision you've just received. And I could share stuff with you that'll startle you from leaders that have heard what you've heard tonight. It would startle you if I named the names and shared with you what they shared. And many of them, I've told them, I said, I'm not going to print that. I'm not going to print that because I don't want you to have to stand where I'm standing. Because I am just a major bullseye. I'm a major target for all these charlatans that if their money dried up, they would change their message. But as long as you keep sending them money and buying their books, they're going to keep preaching their garbage. Now, Judgment Day hasn't come yet, but we're close. Lyndall, I don't know. I used to think that, you know, we're close to Sodom and Gomorrah. We've passed Sodom and Gomorrah. When I was here last time, I preached on Sodom, living, plain living, plain leaving. If you didn't get that message, you need to get it. About living in the plains, plain living, the plains outside of Sodom. How a lot of people live outside sin. They don't live in Sodom and Gomorrah. They just live close to it. So they can go in and sin and then go back home. But we're past that. We're so past Sodom. We're so, oh, folks, look this way. We are, read about it. Read it for yourself. We're so far past that. Read that and then look at the local news. Okay, just read that and look at the news. Okay? What is the, and I, I feel embarrassed not knowing what, but what is the men and boys, is it Mamba, men and boys, uh, huh? Mambla? I remember going to a convention, and they were just having oral sex and sodomy right on the streets in Washington, right on the streets, right in front of me. And I went to the horseman, the policeman, and I said, this is America. That's against the law. You know what they said? They said, um, it is America, and that is against the law, and we can't stand it. But it'll go away tomorrow. And we'd rather for it to just go away peacefully than start a riot today by arresting them. And I thought, boy, if that's not a picture of the church. But you know what? It didn't go away, folks. It came all the way in. And now look what we're fighting. A church that has no direction. Find me a Pentecostal church where people speak in tongues, lift their hands, where there's prophecies and words from the Lord. Oh, they're so hard to find. That word that Daniel just spoke to you was from a large Pentecostal church in our city that is planting other churches all over the city like weeds. So we're going to close. Those of you at home that don't know the Lord, if you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, He's the only way. He's the only way to heaven. And there's no other forgiveness outside of Jesus. You can pray to your idols. You can pray to your gods. But Jesus died for you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He shed his blood for you 2,000 years ago. He doesn't have to do anything more. He's died for you. Now it's time for you to die for him. He set it all up. It's called crucifixion. 
I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, lest I live. That means I've died to self, and now Christ lives his life through me. Show me a Christian. Show me a Christian. Show me anybody that lives for Jesus rather than self. Hmm. So if you need forgiveness right now at home, we're going to pray. Everyone in this room, if you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, you put your hand up and put it right back down. Don't hesitate. Sin is in your life. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Pastors don't preach on it anymore. That doesn't mean it's not real. It is real. And it will damn you to a place called hell. And so you need forgiveness before you walk out of this convention center. God forbid that you're hit outside this center in an automobile accident and you never make it home, but you do make it to the morgue. God forbid that you landed like that at the end of your life without knowing the Lord. Everyone bow your heads, everyone home bow your heads. If you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, If you need Jesus Christ to forgive you, on the count of three, lift your hands up and put it right back down. If you need forgiveness, put your hand up and put it right back down. No, 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 not yet. On the count of three, put your hand up, put it right like that, right back down. Everybody at home also, on the count of three, up and back down. One, two, three, up and back down. God bless all over this room. Look this way. Now I'm gonna speak to those that are at home, but I wanna speak to them right over here. So set me up. I'm going to look at this camera in three seconds. One, two, three. Those of you that are watching from anywhere in the world, He is with you right there. The same Spirit that is with us here in Mobile, Alabama is with you right there, regardless of where you're at. I've been all over the world, lived all over the world. I love you dearly. Jesus loves you dearly. Pray with me right now, out loud. Say, Jesus, everyone here, keep quiet. You be praying for everyone at home. Say, Jesus, everyone at home, I ask you to forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I repent. Out loud, say, be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, listen up at home. This is God Channel. You see information on the screen. You get in touch with us. Let us know what God is doing in your life. God bless you, Roy and Wendy, for filming this, for beaming this around the world. You want to win a billion people to Jesus. I'm letting you two know this is the only way it's ever going to happen. It won't happen playing pat a cake with Christians. I love both of you. I love God TV. I love every one of you at home. You follow Jesus. He's going after you. You go after him. Now, everyone here that raised your hand, if you did or you didn't, hands, if you raised your hand or you didn't, you need forgiveness, come and kneel at this altar right now. Hurry, 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 come, hurry, come. Ushers, ushers, if people cannot kneel, they don't have to kneel, okay? There's people that are hurting. I can't kneel, by the way, okay? My bones will not let me kneel right now, okay? So I can't kneel. 
but I can kneel in my spirit. Everyone in this building, I want to tell you something. Some of you are lying to God. Oh, go ahead and look at your watch. What on earth does that matter? Some of you sit up and watch TV till 2 in the morning. The Spirit of God's in this place. Man, we were talking just a few minutes ago. What an honor to be in a place where God's at. Everybody's going to turn to the person next to them. You're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. Don't do it yet. If somebody turns to you, even if they're a stranger, and they say, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? You tell them yes. If you do, and then both of you step out together, come and kneel at this altar. But pastor, there's no room. Folks, I lugar. There's room. Okay? As a matter of fact, everybody at the altar, squeeze up. Come up, move up a little bit. We need room for like 300 more people. All right, come on. All right, everybody else, turn to the person next to them. Ask them if they need forgiveness and bring them with you right now. Bring them with you right now. Bring them with you right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Bring them with you right now. Come on. Hurry. 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 Come on. Come on. Over here. Over here. Over here. All the way. 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 All the way, ushers. Ushers, all the way. All the way, ushers. Okay. You couldn't hear me, okay? Ushers, I need your help. How many over here you're trying to come forward? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, trying to come forward. Okay, all this whole area is trying to come forward. There's all kinds of room right here. Ushers, that's why I said, keep them moving. Keep them. Look at all these people. They want to come up. It's so important to move forward for God. Okay, open up that row, man. Let them come through. It's so important, man. Once you've come all the way up, you've shown God how serious you are, man. Yeah, come on. All the way over. Look, oh, look at this, man. They're still coming, man. Let them come. Look at them over there. All the way over. There, look at all this room. They're still coming. Look at them back there. Why do I need to come forward? It's about time you show Jesus how serious you are. He went, to ten, he went to the cross for you. All right, that's it. That's it. Everyone, everyone bow your heads. Everyone bow your heads. So many tears have been shed already. I see. God sees. The team sees. You want forgiveness. The forgiveness is not going to cost you anything. It was paid for on Calvary. Follow-up will cost you everything. That means after this, he wants your life. What Daniel read a few minutes ago is a lie from hell. That's why that church is growing so quickly. Because the Bible says people are going to call others, they want to call teachers that will tickle their ears and make them feel good. Okay? I want to tell you, my friend, the gospel is not a feel-good gospel. Now, there's nobody on earth happier than I am or happier than the people on this platform. But it's because we're serving the Lord. So bow your heads, pray with me out loud, everyone at the altar. Out loud, Jesus. Jesus. No, out loud, do not mumble. Jesus, Jesus. thank you, you. for speaking to me. me. Thank Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. I ask you now to forgive me. I have sinned. I'm sorry. Wash me. I repent. Be my Savior. My Lord. 
and my very best friend. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Glory! Hallelujah! Now, I want that camera to go backwards, and I want everyone at the altar to stand up. I want you to get back as back far as you can. Everybody, y'all, you're all having a hard time, ain't you? You've never been on your knees that long, have you? That hurts. Look at me, folks. Don't go back in your seats yet, okay? Because this is a cool spot right here. Okay, first of all, okay, first of all, see that camera, these cameras? You are on television all over the world. That's cool. So if you got relatives like in Tanzania, you know, they're going to go, it's Lucy. <laughs> but here's, a, here's what I want to do. I want to ask a question, and I want these camera guys to make sure you got this, okay? I want to ask you a question. How many of you came down here tonight to get the sin out of your life and to make sure you're right with Jesus Christ? Raise your hand up high. Raise it up high. Raise it up high. I want the devil to see that. Devil, you lose.